Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay, well, the uh, formal lectures for week two are over now, but what we would like to do is to add two bonus lectures for those of you that would like a little more detail. So the first bonus lecture is one that I'll give. Traditionally, the transport coefficients that we've been discussing are derived by solving the Boltzmann transport equation. What I want to do in this lecture is just go through that traditional way of deriving these transport coefficients and relate them to the work that we've done. And in the next bonus lecture by Dr. Jesse Mason, uh, we'll have a lecture on how you treat realistic full electronic and phonon dispersions and do the kinds of calculations that we've been discussing. Okay, so these are the transport coefficients in coupled current equations that we're now familiar with. We've derived the transport coefficients and expressed them in a couple of different ways, and they all are familiar to us now. Uh, what we'd like to do in this lecture is to show how these coefficients are derived from the Boltzmann transport equation. So these are the topics of this lecture. Five topics. I'd like to explain, first of all, what phase space is. That's a key concept in the Boltzmann equation. Then we'll present a simple little derivation of the Boltzmann transport equation. We'll talk about how we solve it. And then we'll talk about, we'll show how you can use that solution to derive the four thermoelectric transport coefficients. I'll just go through one of those four to show you how it's done. And then finally, we'll try to discuss a little bit how this derivation from the Boltzmann equation relates to our derivation from the Landauer approach. Okay, so the first topic is phase space. So phase space is just a name we give to position and momentum space. Or instead of momentum, we might label it as K space, where K is the wave vector of an electron wave. So the crystal momentum, recall, we write as P is equal to H bar K. So I'll equivalently talk about wave vector or momentum. I always mean crystal momentum. So let's think about a simple little two-dimensional phase space here. If I look at this two-dimensional phase space, I can think about a particle located at some position and at some momentum in this phase space. And the question that we're going to ask is, what is the probability f that at some location x, at some momentum or wave vector k, and at some time t, that a state is occupied? That's the distribution function, and that's what we aim to calculate. Now, we've seen this in equilibrium. In equilibrium, the distribution function is just a familiar Fermi function. But what we need to do in the Boltzmann equation is to apply an, a bias or a small temperature gradient, and our aim is to calculate the uh, distribution function out of equilibrium. Okay. So our goals for this lecture are to find an equation for this distribution function out of equilibrium. We're going to learn how to solve this equation near equilibrium, where the solution is relatively straightforward. And once we've seen that solution, we'll relate it to what we've done in the last several lectures using the Landauer approach. We're only going to be looking at the diffusive limit for samples that are many main free paths long, because that's the, typically the case where we use the Boltzmann equation. So it's the easiest way to relate the results of the Landauer approach to the, uh, to the Boltzmann approach. For those of you that are interested in the details that I'll have to gloss over, I can refer you either to a book of mine or to some online resources that cover the same material in much more detail. Okay. So the Boltzmann equation is a semi-classical equation. The quantum mechanics is embedded in the electronic band structure, but we think about electrons as semi-classical particles. We can write a, an equation of motion in momentum space that looks like Newton's equation for a particle. So dh bar dk is like derivative of momentum with respect to time. Classically, that should be the force. The force is minus gradient of the bottom of the conduction band. We may add an, a magnetic field, and we'll discuss that briefly at the end of the lectures. But for now, we'll just be thinking about the force as being due to an electric field in the sample. Okay. So at any time t, if we know the initial location of the uh, electron, if we know its initial momentum, then we can simply integrate over time and find out how it changes its momentum with time if we know the electric field. Now, we also recall that we know the velocity of an electron from the band structure. It's simply related to the gradient of the band structure. 
So if we know the velocity, we can track the position. If we know the initial position, we can find how it moves in time to other positions. So we can track the electron both in momentum space and in position space in this two-dimensional phase space. There are a number of assumptions involved here. I won't go through them all, but basically it's a semi-classical picture. We assume that the bottom of the conduction band varies slowly with space so that we don't have any quantum mechanical reflections and things like that. We take a single particle approach. Many body effects aren't treated. So if we solve these semi-classical equations of motion and we begin with an electron that's located initially at some position and momentum, we can track the trajectory of this electron through this two-dimensional phase space. So at any time, we'll know its location and its momentum. So that's a, another indication that this is a semi-classical approach. Quantum mechanically, we can't simultaneously specify both the position and the momentum with infinite precision, but semi-classically, that's what we do. So if I'm interested in the probability that this state with the red circle is occupied at some time t, at some momentum state px, I can find that simply by looking upstream on this trajectory. The probability that the upstream state was occupied is going to be the probability that this downstream state is occupied a small time dt later. So we simply, when we ask ourselves, what is the probability that the filled red state is occupied? It's the probability that this empty red state upstream on the trajectory was occupied a short time later. Very simple, look upstream. And if I subtract those two quantities and divide by dt, what this tells me is that the total differential of the occupation function, as long as I'm along one of these trajectories, is equal to zero, the total differential with respect to time. Okay, so that's the key insight. This is our Boltzmann equation. And since the Equation is a function of position, momentum, and time. When I take this total derivative, I just have to do the total derivative with respect to all of the variables, both the explicit time and the implicit time. So total derivative with respect to time is partial f, partial t. And then I'll use the chain rule, partial f, partial x, dx dt, plus partial f, partial px, dp dt, total derivative equals to zero. And then I'll recognize that dx dt is velocity and dp dt is force. And that gives me my Boltzmann transport equation. And here I'm writing it in three dimensions. So we write df dt is equal to velocity dot spatial gradient. Spatial gradient is just the gradient of f in position space, plus force. Force is just the force due to electric and magnetic fields, dot gradient in momentum space which is just the gradient in px, py, pz part of phase space, and the momentum itself is just the crystal momentum, h bar k. Okay. So we have derived the Boltzmann transport equation, which is the equation that we're after, but we've overlooked one very important thing. And that important thing is what makes the Boltzmann equation complex and difficult to solve in practice often, scattering. So the population of this state is not simply the upstream population. It might also be changed. It might increase if electrons scatter into that state from other states. And it might decrease if electrons scatter out from that state to other states. So we have to include these effects of scattering. We're going to make an assumption. And again, this is part of this semi-classical assumption. We assume that the scattering events are very short in time duration. They knock an electron from one position in momentum space to another in a very short time and don't change the position during that scattering event. So then we can write the total rate of change of f due to collisions is some fairly complicated collision operator times f, which accounts for these in-scattering and out-scattering processes. Okay, so formally, we add the effects of collision just by replacing this zero by collision operator times f. Now, if you look at that collision operator itself, it can get quite involved. To get simple analytical solutions to the Boltzmann equation, we're going to need to approximate this collision operator. And there's a widely used approximation called the relaxation time approximation. And the basic idea there is that the effect of collisions is 
to take a small perturbation, delta F, and to react in a negative way to try to pull the system back to equilibrium. So the effect of, the, of collisions is minus the perturbation divided by some characteristic time. That characteristic time will turn out to be the momentum relaxation time, the same time that's in the mobility. And uh, so you, for those of you that are more interested in under what conditions can you make this approximation, one of the very important conditions is under near equilibrium conditions. And since those are the conditions that we've been concerned about throughout this entire week, uh, that's not a limitation for us. But there are additional limitations about the specifics of the scattering process that I refer you to this reference for. So basically what this assumption does is it says if you perturb the system, it will decay back to equilibrium exponentially as e to the minus t over tau m. So it's a very physical, physically motivated assumption. Okay, now we can proceed to solving the Boltzmann equation. We can make our relaxation time approximation for the collision operator. We can neglect magnetic fields for now. We're going to make an assumption that we're near equilibrium. So the probability that a state is occupied is a big part, the equilibrium probability, plus a small deviation from equilibrium delta sub f. That's what we'll try to solve for, that small deviation from equilibrium. So there's an assumption that the equilibrium part of the distribution is much, much larger than that deviation. This is just what we mean by near equilibrium transport. So we've thrown away the time derivative. We're making the relaxation time approximation. This is our steady state Boltzmann equation. We can solve this by approximating the spatial gradient of the distribution function by the spatial gradient of the large part, the near equilibrium part. We'll do the same thing for the gradient in momentum space, approximate it with the large part. In that case, we can simply solve this equation for the perturbation, and by doing that, we very simply, we've solved the Boltzmann equation. So this is what we set out to do. So under these simplifying assumptions, steady state, small perturbations from equilibrium, use of the relaxation time approximation. It's relatively easy to solve for this perturbation from equilibrium, and then once we add it to F naught, we have our solution. Okay, so here's our solution. Now, one of the things you'll notice in going through this derivation is that there's more mathematics involved than there was when we did the Landauer approach. So that's one of the one of the things that happens when we take this Boltzmann equation approach. But this is our solution. I'm going to write the equilibrium distribution function as 1 over 1 plus theta is energy minus Fermi energy over kT. So theta is energy. We'll replace the Fermi energy by a quasi-Fermi energy. So it's something that is very much like a Fermi energy, but it can be position dependent. Energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy, the energy above the bottom of the band. So it just simplifies matters to write the distribution function in terms of this quantity theta. Then when I take the spatial gradient up here, I can use the chain rule. And I can take the gradient of F with respect to the quantity theta and then the spatial gradient of this quantity theta. When I take the gradient in momentum space, I can do the same thing. I can take the gradient of f with respect to theta, and then the gradient of this quantity theta with respect to momentum. And the derivative of f with respect to theta is very much like the derivative of f with respect to energy. We just bring in an extra kT. Okay. So if we do that math, we just rewrite our equation this way. And if we do these derivatives, then we'll have our solution to the Boltzmann equation. So if we do those derivatives, put the two together, we will re-express, you know, we can express the spatial um, gradient of theta as this complicated looking function. We can express the momentum gradient as velocity divided by kT. If we put it all together, a lot of terms drop out and we get this expression for those, the gradient in position and in momentum. I warned you there was going to be a little bit of math, but stick with me on this. If we lump those all together, we, have, we write our solution to the Boltzmann equation as this characteristic time in the relaxation time approximation. 
as minus df naught dE, velocity dot something that has the units of force, F. And that quantity that has the units of force is minus the gradient of the electrochemical potential and some quantity that is gradient of temperature or inverse temperature. So what we find here is something that we know very well from our earlier discussions of the Landauer approach. There are two forces that drive us away from equilibrium. The first is gradients in the quasi-Fermi level. That was the bias we applied across that little device to change the Fermi levels in the contacts. And the second is gradients in temperature, or inverse temperature that comes out here. So we come up with the same two driving forces. We need to because we're looking at the same problem from two different perspectives. But we find that there are two independent quantities that can drive us away from equilibrium. Okay, so we have solved the Boltzmann equation. What do we do next? Well, what we'd like to do next is to calculate something with this solution. We'd like to calculate quantities like the electron density, the current density, the heat current density. And we do that simply by taking various sums. So we have our solution, the perturbation from equilibrium. We know the equilibrium solution. We add the two. We have the total occupation probability of a state in phase space. Now, to get the total electron density, we'll take some arbitrary volume omega in which we're doing all of our bookkeeping. When we apply boundary conditions to that volume, we'll have a discrete number of k states. We simply sum up all of those k states, the probability that the state is occupied. That's the equilibrium probability plus the deviation. The deviation is very small compared to the equilibrium, so we can just ignore the deviation. When we do the current flow, well, of course, in equilibrium, there is no current. So even though the equilibrium distribution is the biggest part, it doesn't give us any current. Then when we do the sum, we only deal with a small deviation from equilibrium. If we want current, each electron carries the charge minus Q and flows at a velocity V. And the probability that it's occupied, we only have to worry about the small part. We perform that sum and we have the current. When we do the electronic heat flow, it's the same kind of sum for a current. Instead of carrying charge, we're carrying heat. And we saw earlier that the amount of heat that an electron carries is energy minus the Fermi energy of the contact that it came from. Okay, so all of this looks familiar from lecture one. We can go ahead and see if we can work out one of these sums. And as an example, let's just do the current and let's see if we can calculate the, uh, the conductivity. So if I insert my solution to the, Bolts, uh, the Boltzmann equation into this sum, I'll be able to write this sum as tau sub m minus df naught dE velocity dot, velocity dot uh, the um, generalized force. And I also have a velocity here, so I have velocity times velocity dot generalized force. So if we look at that, in just lump terms, we've got a vector times a vector. That means we're going to get tensor quantities for these transport coefficients. If we have high symmetry semiconductors, they'll become diagonal tensors. But one of the things that the Boltzmann equation is good for is when we have complex anisotropic materials, it's relatively straightforward to go through the math and derive these conductivity tensors instead of coefficients. Okay, so let's work this out for a simple case. Let's assume that the temperature is constant, so the only driving force is gradients in the quasi-Fermi level. We'll take our solution then, and let's just, let's say that the variations are only in one direction, x, so we don't have to worry about these tensor quantities. And we'll solve for the current in the x direction. And we will do that simply by plugging our solution in once we plug our solution in, the generalized force is gradient of quasi-Fermi level. If we lump all of these terms together, we conclude that current is conductivity times gradient of the quasi-Fermi level. Makes sense. Just what we would have expected it to be. Okay. And we now have an expression for the conductivity. And this is the expression for the conductivity as it comes from a solution to the Boltzmann equation. Okay, we're still not done yet. Uh, we have to evaluate this sum and then we'll get a final answer.
Okay. So to work out this expression, we need to know how to evaluate sums in K space. And here again, I'm going to remind you of something that you may have seen before. If you haven't, I'd refer you to these references. If we have a large volume that we've applied boundary conditions to, and we're doing our counting of k-states in this volume, then the k-states are very closely spaced. And instead of summing, we can integrate over these closely spaced uh, states if we have the right number of states in each unit of volume dk. And it turns out that you can do this counting of k-states. They're uniformly distributed in k-space. In 3D, the number of states is the volume divided by 8 pi cubed times 2 for spin because each of these states will hold a spin up and spin down electron. So with this prescription, we can convert the sum to an integral. Okay. All right, so if we go ahead and do that, we convert the sum, we convert this sum over k space to an integral over k space. We'll integrate over the three-dimensional k space. So 4 pi k squared dk is the element of volume. We'll go from 0 to infinity and integrate over the entire volume of k space. And we simply need to perform that integral. I've inserted a valley degeneracy factor here because we may be dealing with a material like silicon that has six equivalent conduction band valleys. Okay, so we need to work out this integral. And uh, that can be done. I won't go through all of the details, but it's uh, useful for you to work through those and see if you can get the final answer. The velocity, remember we only have spatial variation in one direction, but we're talking about a three-dimensional semiconductor. Electrons are moving in the x, y, and z directions. The energy and velocity is equally distributed in x, y, and z directions. Uh, you may wonder, well, we're applying a bias in the x direction. Shouldn't we get a bigger velocity in the x direction? But we're near equilibrium, so that's a very small effect. So essentially, we can say that vx squared is equal to vy squared is equal to vz squared. The sum is equal to the total magnitude of the velocity. So we can express this quantity here in terms of the total magnitude of the velocity brings in a factor of 3. We can continue to do a little more bookkeeping. We can change our integration from k space to energy space if we assume a dispersion. Let's assume a simple parabolic dispersion. We'll assume that the scattering time doesn't depend on the direction of k in momentum space, but only depends on the uh, energy. So we're assuming an isotropic case. In fact, we'll make it even easier and assume that the scattering time is independent of energy. If we do that, we'll change variables of integration from k space to energy space. We get an integral. We can evaluate that integral, and we're almost done. And here's the answer. You know, it's not as simple or pretty as we'd like it to be, but it's not that bad. So we have conductivity is Q times Q tau over M. Already we'll recognize that as mobility. And then we have a bunch of factors involving effective masses and, uh, and Fermi-Dirac integral of order one-half. This argument A to F is just the Fermi energy with respect to the bottom of the conduction band in units of kT. So that's what the math gives us. You might recall that there's a simple relation between the Fermi energy and the electron density in 3D, and it's just given by this expression. Some quantities we call the effective density of states that involves these effective masses and valley degeneracies and a Fermi-Dirac integral of order one-half. Okay. So we finally end up with a result that we could have guessed. After all of this work, conductivity is n, Q times Q tau over M, NQ mu, just what we would have guessed. Okay. But we could have done it in, with much more complicated band structures. We could have done it under anisotropic conditions. We could have done it for any of the four transport coefficients. But this, these kinds of steps are the steps that we would go through in all of those other processes. If the scattering time happened to be energy dependent, as it usually is, then our result would have been Q times some specially defined average energy, average scattering time divided by M, would look the same. And I'll refer you to the references I cited earlier if you want to see what that average um, scattering time is. Okay, but this doesn't really look like our Landauer approach. It must be the same because we're solving the same problem. So let's look briefly about how we would make this result 
how we would relate it to what we've derived from the Landauer approach. So let's go back a few steps. You know, let's go back when we were beginning to do this integral and we change variables to energy. Let's go back there. Okay. So we'll go back. You know, this is just after we converted the sum over k states to an integral over k states. Then we converted to uh, an integral over energy, st energy space. But let's start lumping the parameters inside that integral in a different way. If we recognize what the three-dimensional density of states is, uh, we recognize that the velocity squared is 3 times Vx squared. We can recognize, uh, since these are parabolic bands, what the distribution of modes is. And if we define this mean free path for backscattering, yeah, in this way, v squared at some energy times tau divided by the average energy in the x direction. And this, you know, turns out to be the proper definition for this mean free path for backscattering that we've been using in the Landauer approach. Then we can simply go through a little bit of algebra and we see that this equation that led us to nq mu also leads us to an expression that begins to look like the Landauer expression. So when we get all done, we find that we can also write this expression as quantum of conductance times average number of channels in the Fermi window times a specially defined average mean free path. So the results from solving the Boltzmann equation are exactly the results from solving the uh, Boltz, uh, from the Landauer approach as they should be. Now, it's also just as easy to go through and to solve for the Seebeck coefficient, the Peltier coefficient, the electronic thermal conductivity. And in every case, we'll find that we can get the same result that we got from the Boltzmann transport equation. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so we have two different ways of doing the problems. Sometimes the Boltzmann equation is the approach to use. Sometimes the Landauer approach is the approach that you would prefer. One case where it's convenient to use the Boltzmann transport equation is when we have a, a, a magnetic field. We're measuring a Hall effect or something. It's straightforward to include a magnetic field in the Boltzmann equation. We simply take the uh, force on the electron, and instead of just an electric field, we add the magnetic force. And then we go through and do the calculation. There's even more math involved, but it's straightforward step by step. If you keep everything straight, you'll find the conductivity in the presence of a B field. Okay. So when we do that, remember that our equations without a B field look like this. The transport coefficients were just, for isotropic materials, were just coefficients, not tensors. And we derive these. We can do them either from the Boltzmann equation or from the Landauer approach. We get the same answers. Now, even if we have an isotropic material and we apply a B field, what we're going to find is that the results that we get is that all of the transport coefficients now become functions of the magnetic field. So people learned an awful lot about semiconductor band structures in the 1960s by doing careful measurements of all of these thermoelectric transport coefficients as a function of magnetic fields in various directions. And from those kinds of measurements, they could deduce that uh, germanium must have an ellipsoid oriented along 111 directions and various things like that. Uh, we still use this very commonly uh, when we do measurements such as Hall effect measurements to, to characterize materials. So that's an example of where the Boltzmann equation is particularly useful. So just to wrap up, um, the point of this approach is, uh, of this lecture has been to relate the two approaches to calculating the transport coefficients. What we've been spending the week discussing is the Landauer approach. The Landauer approach, we think, offers some clear physical insight. It works in the ballistic limit as well as the quasi-ballistic limit and in the diffusive regimes where it's convenient to use the Boltzmann equation. It does not even require a band structure, which a Boltzmann equation does. If you're interested in the thermoelectric coefficient of a molecule, you can compute it from the Landauer approach. It's not clear if you begin with the Boltzmann transport equation how you would do that kind of calculation, but it's straightforward with a Landauer approach. The Boltzmann equation uh, has some advantages. We can easily put a magnetic field in. The anisotropic materials and transport uh, tensors we can treat in a straightforward way. 
We can resolve transport spatially. In the Landauer approach, we're not resolving quantities as a function of position. Sometimes that's necessary, and it's relatively straightforward to do that in the Boltzmann equation. Uh, in the Boltzmann equation, we can easily uh, also treat, maybe not easily, but we can treat off-equilibrium transport large biases where we have large amounts of inelastic scattering that are position dependent. Uh, we can do ballistic transport too, not quite as easy. And what you find when you solve the Boltzmann equation is that there tends to be more mathematics involved. It tends to be harder to get at least harder for me when I teach this material in class to develop physical intuition as to what these transport coefficients really are. But we have these two approaches. Uh, both of them are useful and needed. You should understand both of them and be able to select the right approach to use for the right problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, so thank you for sticking with me. And uh, for those of you that are interested in how to do these kinds of calculations for complex band structures, uh, please view the next bonus lecture in this series. Thank you.